I'm joined once again today by Dr. Aubrey de Grey. He's a biomedical gerontologist and chief science officer of the SENS Research Foundation. He is one of the foremost researchers in the field of solving the problem of aging, as he puts it. Dr. de Grey, really interesting article, not written by you, but it mentions you actually in The Guardian by George Mombiot, and it names you specifically. And the article says that we do have some advancements in the field of solving the problem of aging, but that if you are successful in solving this problem, which as you have said could lead to people living to a thousand years or longer, that there are some significant problems societally that may develop. And I don't think I'm overstepping by saying that George Mombiot basically writes off your your explanations of these potential problems as silly, right? So let's go through this piece by piece. One of the things that is made, one of the arguments made in the article is that there will be such significant inequality if these types of treatments and procedures are available that we will have r the rich living much longer and the poor may even have shorter lives than they have today. So let's start there. Why were you annoyed with this article? Wow. Oh, first of all, thank you for having me back on the show. It's always a great pleasure. Um, let me give a general answer to that question. The main reason why I was annoyed by the article was that it made the claim, implicitly in many cases, that there had never been anything from my side, any kind of effort to address these concerns, to consider them and to offer potential solutions or to offer an argument, any kind of argument, why those concerns should either not be viewed as significant or at least should be viewed as subordinate to the positives involved in the defeat of aging, namely the elimination of ill health and all the suffering that goes with it. Right. Um, in the specific case of inequality of access, I'm on almost ad nauseam record as pointing out that these therapies are going to pay for themselves, that the cost of these therapies will probably be quite substantial, at least at first, but that even if it is substantial, it will be absolutely dwarfed by the amount of money we will save, first of all, by not having to spend money on the kind of conventional therapies we have today that try, without success, to postpone the ill health of old age. And secondly, the enormously, even bigger, indirect costs that we're talking about here, such as the fact that the elderly will, if they are still able-bodied, be able to continue contributing wealth to society, and the fact that the kids of the elderly will be more productive because they won't have to spend time looking after their sick parents, all those things. Well, you're right, because you you and I spoke about this. In other words, I remember in our first interview, which at this point may have been three or four years ago, I said to you very specifically, um, uh, what about access, right? Is this going to be like we already have in our, at least in the United States, I know you're in England now, at least in the United States, a for-profit employer-connected health insurance system. I can only imagine that the the disproportionality of access would, would exist with these types of treatments. And if I recall correctly, you said, yes, initially that may be the case, but over the long term, you imagine that that's a problem that would be solved. But But this was years ago. That's right. And of course, your interview was by no means the only one in which I said these things. And other people have been saying them too. So to be perfectly honest, I have to you know, I have to say that this particular article in The Guardian was an example of spectacularly irresponsible, self-serving, you know, gut, uh, 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 um, you know, gutter drivel, really. It was absolutely outrageous. Well, I think um, it might be interesting because you and I, some of the other issues that the article tries to bring up, like, wouldn't it be really boring? What about dictators ruling forever? You've addressed those issues. So I'm kind of curious. I don't think I've ever asked you, what do you see as the main potential risks or problems that could surface if you and your colleagues are successful in solving the problem of aging? In other words, rather than have you debunk what other people think are the problems, what are your concerns? I, I honestly don't have any. Okay. Way back. Way back 10 or 15 years ago, I was at least a little bit ambivalent about one or two of them. 
the, way, the main one that was on my mind was risk aversion, the idea that we would have difficulty doing things we do today, like you know, driving or even crossing the street, because we would feel that we had so much more to lose by, um, by taking these risks. Uh, however, quite rapidly, at least a decade ago, I realized that even that was actually a misplaced concern because the actual situation will be that we will simply throw money at such problems. We will make safer cars or we will spend more money on vaccine development so that we have far lower risk of pandemics, things like that. This is obviously what we're going to do, just as we've always done in the past when our risk profile has altered as a result of technological progress. So, to be honest, I have none. And what really frustrates me is that people just refuse to listen. You know, I give these answers time and time again, and people just pretend that I've never given them. Let's t talk a little bit about uh, overpopulation, right? As, as any as simple math tells us, if you have a death rate that exceeds your birth rate, you are going to have a decrease in the population. And if you have the inverse, you'll have an increase in the population. If such technologies so drastically reduce the death rate, are you of the mind, which some people are, that we will have a significant overpopulation problem? Or are you more free market libertarian minded where you say, well, no, naturally the the birth rate will be decreased to account for the decreased death rate? Or is it some other uh, explanation altogether? It's kind of some other explanation altogether. I wouldn't want to rely on the free markets to, you know, to do these things. The free market is often not terribly um, generous. It's quite callous sometimes. But you put the question in exactly the right way. It's ultimately a balance between the birth rate and the death rate. And something that a lot of people have absolutely no idea of is that today that balance is ridiculously far from unity. Hmm. At the moment, about 150,000 people die each day, which sounds like a lot of people. But do you want to know how many people are born each day? Yeah. It's more than 350,000. In other words, it's more than twice as many as the people that die. So even if we were completely to eliminate all death, not just death from aging, but all death today by waving some magic wands, then we could actually result in a declining world population just by halving the birth rate. Now, I'm not telling you that halving the birth rate is easy, don't get me wrong, but I am saying that this is the kind of calculation one needs to look at in order to get one's arms around the quantitative nature of the problem. Now, the specific answers that I give to the question of overpopulation in the longer term, at the end of the day, rely on the fact that we are talking about the longer term. People have some kind of knee-jerk instinct that the, the moment we bring medicines that defeat aging into play, suddenly we're going to have twice as many people as we had the previous year. And of course, what's actually going to happen is that the change in the demographics of the world, or of any given region of the world for that matter, will be very gradual. That in fact, you know, we're not going to have any 200-year-old people for at least 100 years. Whatever happens, right? I mean, that's completely obvious. Right. But a lot of people just overlook it. And the um, result of all this is quite interesting because the fact is all we need to do in order to actually get some kind of really you know, plausible answer to these questions is to avoid the temptation to presume that this change in our demographic distribution is going to happen in isolation. That's what people do. They think, they think like, 100 years from now, we're going to have uh, too many people because we've got no death or whatever. But they're going to think of it in the context of nothing else changing, mm -hmm. which is insane. You know, how much happened in the last 100 years, right? And we know that we're going to have completely different situation in terms of the level of automation, and in particular, in the level of energy utilization. We know perfectly well that we're going to have far better renewable energy, we're almost certainly going to have nuclear fusion, and so on and so forth. And these things, of course, are going to reduce our carbon footprint, and that's going to increase the carrying capacity of the planet. Of course, we have to do the same kind of thing with all of the other ways in which we pollute the planet, so as to really increase the planet's carrying capacity. But that's 
not just a plausible scenario, it's a very, very likely scenario. So it's completely crazy and absolutely irresponsible to go out and say, oh dear, we're going to have too many people, let's not develop therapies that will alleviate suffering and save lives. We've been speaking with Dr. Aubrey de Grey. We will link to the Guardian article by George Mambiat that we've been discussing in the YouTube clip for this segment. And, you know, we're out of time and we haven't even gotten into actually the last year of research, but we'll have you back soon to talk about that. A pleasure as always to have you on. I look forward to coming back. Thank you, David.